The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome one and all to the Exxon Radio Show. I am Rob McConnell, and for the next four hours, I am your host and your guide as together we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the Exxon. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And the Exxon comes to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to send me an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And to find out about the programming we have available for you 24-7, 365 on the Exxon Broadcast Network, simply visit www.xzbn.net. Don't forget, Exxon Nation, the January-February edition of the X chronicles newspaper is now available for one and all with our compliments and the compliments of our advertisers at www.xchroniclesnewspaper.com. My guest this hour is Joseph Marino. He has a BA in Theological Studies from St. Louis University and is a longtime syndonologist. Uh, that's one who studies the Shroud of Turin. He has researched, written, and lectured extensively on the Shroud since 1977. He currently works at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. In 1977, he saw a book on the Shroud of Turin, which he had never heard of before, even though he was raised as a Catholic. He read the book in one sitting and became fascinated by the subject and proceeded to collect any material on it that he could possibly find. In January 1980, he started living in the, at the Benedictine Monastery in St. Louis Priory, which later became known as the St. Louis Abbey. In 1986, he attended the first Shroud Conference and met for the first time many of the top scientists and researchers involved. In the early 1990s, he felt drawn to the priesthood and was subsequently ordained in 1994. In 1997... Uh, Joseph received a call from Sue Benford, who informed him of her spiritual insights about the Shroud. After many discussions via phone and emails about the Shroud and other spiritual matters, he began to experience God in a whole new way. Joseph felt powerfully drawn to leave the monastery to pursue Shroud research and other spiritual paths with Benford. Joining me now is Joseph Marino, and Joseph, welcome to the Exxon. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for having me. My great pleasure, sir. Um, what What do you think was your calling to to get into the research of the Shroud of Turin? Um, I've just always felt um, a pull to, you know, research it and mm-hmm. then spread the message about it. Uh, it was fairly well known in, in Europe. Yes. Um, in the early 70s, but it didn't become well-known in the United States until the late 70s when the Sturt team went over. And, um, you know, I started collecting materials in the late 70s and started giving um, lectures. And, um, you know, people were, I could see people were touched and um, Mm -hmm. I expanded later to giving talks at uh, conferences and writing papers. And I've written a book And I've just always felt drawn to um, let as many people know as I could about 
the existence of the shroud and the possible messages related to it. All right, so why don't we do this? For our listeners around the world listening to us tonight who may not know what the Shroud of Turin is, why don't you go ahead and explain it, sir? Okay. Shroud of Turin is a long linen cloth. It's about 14 feet, 3 inches long by 3 feet, 7 inches wide. And it contains the front and back images of a man who uh, appears to have been crucified uh, in, the, in the manner described by the Gospels um, of ha- as having happened to Jesus. And um, one of the big questions about the Shroud is, how did that image get on there? Mm-hmm. And uh, to this day, that, that question has never really been answered. I mean, people that think it's a fake, you know, will come up with all sorts of explanations, paintings, rubbings, uh, you know, reflections off sure. glass, camera obscura, and no real uh, method that anybody has described, whether they believe that the shroud's authentic or not, really explains all the characteristics uh, we find on it. So I, I per, uh, see that that question is probably going to go on possibly indefinitely. Now, hasn't the shroud been to be proved a medieval fake by C-14 testing? Well, it was carbon dated in 1988, mm-hmm. and uh, three labs uh, one in Oxford in England, one in Zurich in Switzerland, and one in uh, Arizona, University of Arizona in the United States, um, performed a test, and they came up came up with a combined date of A.D. 1260 to 1390, which obviously would be too late to have wrapped Jesus, uh, who lived around, who died around 30 A.D. Right. Um, but there's been a lot of questions about that carbon dating for one thing they only had they really only tested one piece the original protocol that called for uh several pieces to be taken mm-hmm. and um ultimately they they only took one piece and divided it up among the labs and kept a, an extra sample and they um they all agreed came in in their datings but there's the real question of whether the sample that was taken was actually representative of the shroud, because it's it's it was taken from a corner, mm-hmm. uh, which had apparently had been repaired, and uh, the theory that my late wife Sue and I um, actually kind of uh, pushed forward uh, starting in 2000 was that that sample was actually um, a rewoven sample. And we, we did find a lot of uh, evidence that um, French uh, weavers had a technique called French invisible reweaving. And when um, some people heard that at first, they thought, oh, you're, you're just making something up. But if you looked it up on the Internet, uh, that technique um, really does exist. And people, our companies still do that today where they repair um textiles and clothes and stuff where you can't really even tell that there has been a ripper that's a right hair in, in garment that, that's right it's called invisible weaving and it's used today the by invisible me- reweaving yeah. exactly yeah um what is the significance if the shroud of turin is actually real how will it affect history well you know a lot of people obviously there's billions of people that that believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Mm-hmm. And, of course, Christianity is one of the big world religions. And, um, for example, Muslims will say that uh, Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. Mm-hmm. And the evidence, if the, shroud, if the evidence on the shroud is true, it shows that this man really did die, uh, assuming it is Jesus. We can never prove... 100 percent to everybody's satisfaction that well how it's actually wrapped jesus but, how would you prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that even if the shroud of turin proves to be dated to the right time period that in fact the image that is sustained in the shroud is that of actually jesus christ of nazareth right you can't prove it 100 percent, but if you look at if you put, look at the totality of that image and the mm-hmm. uniqueness of it, and the fact that the the man on the shroud has each and every 
wound, including the crown of thorns and mm-hmm. the piercing in the side. Um, I mean, the odds of it being someone else are just, they're just so off the chart, they're, they're, it's not even worth considering. But Plus it is, but it is, that we don't know but it how is, the image got on. But it is feasible. Theoretically, it's possible, sure. Only I, I don't think you'll find anybody uh, that's researched the shroud that says this This 100% proves that, um, that it wrapped Jesus of Nazareth and that it shows evidence of the resurrection, although you can make a pretty strong case circumstantially and otherwise that right. that is the case. So if you cannot prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt, once again... What is the significance of the shroud if, in fact, you can't prove it is the shroud that allegedly wrapped the body of Jesus Christ up after his crucifixion? Yeah. Well, I think it uh, it makes people think, for one thing. Um, you know, personally, I think um, God would never put out enough evidence— um, that would overcome faith. I think there, even with the shroud, mm-hmm. there's there's going to be room for faith. All I mean, right, when the... stand, stand by, please. Um, we have to take our first break. Exo Nation, our guest this hour is Joseph Marino. His website is homestead.com forward slash new vistas. And we'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And don't forget, the X-Chronicles newspaper for January and February is now available at www.xchroniclesnewspaper.com. I'm Rob McConnell. This is the X-Own. Don't go away. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Gwilda Wiaka's latest book, The Science of Magic, Book of Mysteries, Volume 1, is the first book in a series based on her writings that open every episode of the Science of Magic radio show. Drawing on the subject matter of each guest, and armed with over 40 years' experience in shamanism, 35 years in alternative health, and degrees in psychology and religious studies, Wilda introduces relevant and leading-edge information that supports spiritual evolution and personal empowerment. Rich with wisdom and inspirational quotes packaged in digestible segments, this is a book that will pull you from cover to cover. It will also serve as a daily inspirational reading for years to come. The Science of Magic Book of Mysteries, Volume 1, is available at our website, tsompublications.com, amazon.com, and wherever fine books are sold. Back in Victorian England, a famous theologian posed a perplexing riddle. Why are the two top personalities in the Bible tagged with the numbers 7 and 11? Academics agree the answer is found in the stunning discovery of a hitherto secret Bible structure explained in a new book called The Genesis Grid. The discovery is so simple that preschool children could illustrate it. Certain claims are hugely controversial and may offend some, but at the X-Zone, we've studied this awesome new book and agree with one expert, and I quote, These discoveries appear to be beyond coincidence. So who or what hid this wonderful pattern in the Bible, and what might they do next? Find out more, X-Zone Nation, and read reviews on www.genesisgrid.co.uk. That's www.genesisgrid.co.uk. X-Zone Nation, Joseph Marino was my special guest this hour. We're talking about the Shroud of Turin. 
And uh, Joseph, uh, before we went to the break, um, did I understand right that that you don't believe God would give proof positive that this shroud was that of Jesus Christ? Right. I think, um, you know, for example, when when they couldn't find Jesus's body mm-hmm. after his death, right? you had the option of believing that he rose from the dead, like some people thought, or mm-hmm. you could believe the story that the body was stolen, as some people, you know, were putting forth. Right. So there's no really knockdown proof of anything. I mean, you could... Paul said 5,000 witnesses saw Jesus, and many people, you know, rely on that, and it's it's that sort of testimony that makes them believe in Jesus, yet other people don't accept that. So, you know, there's really no knockdown proof that's going to convince everybody, and I think there's always going to be room for faith, and that's included with, despite the huge amount of evidence that I feel that there's on the Shroud, it's <clears throat> excuse me. It's, mm-hmm. There's never enough to get to a hundred percent proof. But why wouldn't God? Why would He not want to give His believers one hundred percent proof that this, in fact, is the shroud that wrapped up His Son in the tomb? Well, if you look at, at biblical history, I think one of the most important elements or themes throughout Mm -hmm. is the need for faith. And that just seems to be the the way God operates in salvation history, that he requires you to believe um, without full, what we would call scientific proof. Um, That's, you know, that's as much as I, I think I can say on that. Sure. I, it, well, I can understand I, that going back to the faith. time when the Bible was written. It was way back when, when there was not the knowledge that we have amassed today. So I can understand that back in those days, faith would go a long way. But in today's society, we're a, we're a fact-based society. And I think it even applies to religion, because unless you can prove it, why should we believe it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I, there have always been mm-hmm. fights about um, which religion is right, and, and of course there's always fight, fights within each religion <laughs> on who's right. Um, it's just, it just seems like, um, like many facets in life, people have different opinions and positions, and I don't know if there's, there's an easy answer to, to come to a, a conclusion that everybody would buy in any particular religion or within religions. Okay, so let's get back to the shroud here. Uh, Who owns the shroud? Well, it was owned by the um, House of Savoy, which is the ruling family of France and Italy. Mm -hmm. And the last surviving uh, king of the House of Savoy died in 1983. And when he died, he um, willed it to the living pope, um, and the reason he did that was that he felt that uh, if he donated to the Catholic Church uh, per se, mm-hmm. then too many people might have opinions, you know, like cardinals or whatever, on what to do with it. Whereas, since it was uh, will to the living Pope, it put pretty much the power of decision in, in just one man's uh, hands. Uh, and I think, I think that was probably... A pretty wise decision. So at the moment, Pope Francis is the uh, official owner of the shroud. Interesting. So what is the Catholics' uh, position on the shroud? The Catholic Church, that is. Um, they're a little bit cagey on how they describe it. They won't say it's authentic. Um, their their pronouncements seem to cast doubt on the uh, validity of the C-14 dating mm-hmm. as disauthenticating, they kind of use the words like uh, it's a symbol, an icon, a relic, uh, you know, kind of ambiguous terms that kind of leaves it open uh, for people to, dis- you know, make their own decision on it. And even if, um, you know, everybody, even if everybody agreed it was the burial cloth of Jesus, even scientifically, mm-hmm. um 
the Catholic Church would never say, okay, it's authentic, you must believe it's true, because it's, it's just not a, a dogma that they would promulgate, because relics kind of just don't fall un- under that umbrella. You know, it's, it's very confusing, because in, on one hand, they want you to believe in a deity, God, that has never been seen. Uh, they want you to believe in the fact that his son is Jesus Christ, which cannot be proven. And yet, if this shroud is able to tie the, the, uh, the chain of evidence together, it would give unequivocal proof. So I don't understand why they don't want to go forward and, and either say, yes, it is, or no, it isn't. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, when you're dealing with a billion people at a time, in terms of believers, yeah, mm-hmm. I guess you kind of steer for a middle course. But um, I have not been pleased, you know, with the way um, the Catholic Church um, has dealt with the Shroud in many instances. So, and it was great that they allowed the scientists to study it in 1978. But then they they had real, two real snafus. Um, one was the 88 dating and the, the politics and the bad decisions that was made and made with that. And then also they did a, a kind of a secret restoration of the shroud in 2002, and they rent, re- renovated it more or less um, without consulting international experts all around the world, and, and a lot of the scientists said, oh my goodness, they, they've actually destroyed scientific evidence that was valuable, I mean, even historical evidence. But if the shroud and, was left to the living Pope, wasn't it his decision and his decision alone? Well, you got to kind of understand the church politics. Um, it's in Turin, which is a city in northwest Italy. It's about mm-hmm. 350 miles uh, northwest of uh, Rome, near the French border. Right. And the Cardinal of Turin is normally kind of the um, the overseer, although the, the Vatican and the Pope really make all the final decisions and then kind of um, funnel them down, you know, to the Archbishop or the Cardinal of Turin, whatever it may be at the time. Um, but they, I feel, I personally feel that they really made some super bad decisions in the 88 testing and they could very easily let another team of scientific um, personnel come in. I mean, the science has, has increased exponentially since 1978. They could find out huge uh, numbers of new findings from, from the technology and science that's available today. And yet they continue to sit on it. They'll, they'll do exhibitions. Mm -hmm. There's been um, quite a few, um, since 78, there was the one in 78 was done in conjunction with the STERP team doing their, their testing. Then there were exhibitions in 98, 2000, uh, 2010, and 2015, with the next one being in 2025. And I think they should, you know, they could rectify their, their errors um, by allowing scientists to come in, but for some reason they don't want to do that and i've seen many commentators say that they they would prefer that it remained a mystery rather than possibly coming to uh, a more definite conclusion about it well that makes perfect sense because if it is put through the most recent uh, methods of testing and it is proven a fraud or a hoax or it does or the dating doesn't match then the church would lose not only um, a, a relic, but they would also lose a lot of money because I'm sure whenever they they put this shroud out on exhibit, it's a cash cow for the church. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure how much uh, money Torin makes um, when they have those exhibitions because it takes a lot of money to put them on, of course, and mm-hmm. they have uh, hundreds and hundreds of volunteers that help with that. But um, the flip side, I think, to that, what you just mentioned, is the fact that, um, you know, given that you'll never prove it 100%, I feel that the longer you go and don't disauthenticate it, the more chance there is that it really is authentic. And if you do that, if you're, if you're in the business of trying to win souls for Christ and you've got the shroud, why not use it, you know, is my feeling. You know, if you, 
let the scientists um, look at it again. I mean, I don't think there's any evidence that they'll come out uh, with that would uh, override the 100, uh, 100 plus years of evidence that seems to point to it, it being authentic. But the hundred and some odd years that point to it being authentic have not been able to be proven yet, right? Right. So how can we say uh, that the proof points to it being authentic? Because all it is right now is hearsay. Well, that's why, I mean, that, that's all the more reason, mm-hmm. I think, to allow new testing, because um, they would just, they could confirm a lot of, what they found in 78, and I think there would be tons of new findings. Um, and, and again, I have to be clear on this. Yeah. Um, you, you can't reach 100% certainty, but again, I think the longer you go without disauthenticating, the, the better chance there is that it is real. Well, what would happen? You and I have to take a break. When we come back, um, another hypothetical situation. Exonation. Nation, our guest is Joseph Marino. His website is homestead.com forward slash new vistas. And this is the Exon. I am Rob McConnell. We're talking about the Shroud of Turin this hour. And if you'd like to send me an email, whether you're a skeptic or a believer, Exxon at exxonradiotv.com. We'll be back right after this break. Don't go away. Broadcast studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, to the world and beyond. You're watching the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. ABS Media Day. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State-certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnick's, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the Word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God. It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God, and finally, After the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. 
For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Joseph Marino is our special guest explanation. We're talking about the Shroud of Turin. And uh, Joseph, I can understand another possible reason why the church would not like a definitive answer, besides what I, I, I said earlier about the monetary aspect. Let us say that after a hundred years of the possibility of this shroud being the legitimate artifact that many believers believe it is, and it was proven beyond a shadow of a doubt, based on carbon dating or some other scientific method, that the shroud does not ba- uh, date back to when uh, it is believed that Christ was crucified. What kind of PR fiasco would this be for the church, and what would it do to any other claims of artifacts that the church may have? Oh, I agree. If if they came up with evidence that the shroud was authentic, I think you'd have uh, droves of people... Um, leaving the church and then the ones that stayed would probably be questioning, Mm -hmm. you know, everything that the church is putting out. So yes, I, I I agree with you. I think there's a a possible danger there and that's possibly why they, they would rather leave it a mystery. Um, have there been any miracles, uh, associated with the shroud? Um, there's one case of a, a a little girl in England in the 1950s. Mm-hmm. Um, she had a disease in which the doctor said she probably wouldn't live beyond her teens. And she got a special showing. They brought the shroud out, especially for her. Um, a, a English war veteran named uh, Leonard Cheshire brought her over from England to Turin, and they brought the, the shroud out for her, and they put it on her lap. And um, she eventually uh, lived um, as into adulthood, married, mm-hmm. had children, and attended the 1978 exposition. And um, she later died of something else, but not related to the disease. So that's pretty much the, the closest thing to a miracle that I'm aware of related to the shroud. Has there been much hands-on... Um... Uh, hands-on experiences uh, for other members of the church? Has it been felt by members of the clergy? Has it been, I don't know, what would you do with a with a shroud relic? Um, has, has any member of the clergy reported any special feelings, any, any special messages, any special visitations, visions? Uh, I'm not aware, aware of any clergy. There's been um, some nuns and um, lay women that have had various mystical um, experiences with it. Um, I think one has to be uh, a bit cautious about those. But I mean, I know a lot of people that have that have gone to the expositions of mm-hmm. the shroud and have just been spiritually uplifted um you know everybody's experience is a little different i saw it twice i saw it in 1998 and 2000 and i can't say anything particularly unusual or or, you know super awesome happened but it it was a thrill to be able to see it you know after having studied it for so long uh but it's i think it's just a spiritual uplifting experience to look at the face on the shroud, look at the full body and realize that, um, you know, perhaps even mm-hmm. if it's not authentic, the wounds you see on the man on the shroud, you know, that that's exactly very close to what would have happened to Jesus himself. Why do some people take the study of the shroud as seriously as you do? What you know? What are your hopes? What are your what? Are you, what are you hoping to accomplish? What are you hoping to find? What are you hoping to learn? Um, I mean, it's kind of a hard, hard question to answer. It's sort of like I think it's sort of like asking somebody why they wanted to climb Mount Everest. I mean, 
uh, there's just a certain drive. It's, o- it's mm-hmm. almost like um, I'm being controlled from the outside to do this somehow. It's, it's just something I've always been drawn to. And um, I just feel an, uh, a desire and um, I just want to, you know, let as many people as I can know about this and, and hope, hope that it uh, helps them in their spiritual life. I hope you don't think this next question is going to seem ignorant, and it's certainly not to be ignorant. But how would the the possibility, you know, how would a shroud that hasn't been authenticated have an effect on anyone's spiritual life? Well, the answer to that is that that it has over the years. Simple as that. Um, it, it's had a huge effect on my life. It had a um, uh, an impact on me joining the monastery in 1980. Mm-hmm. It had an impact on me leaving the monastery in 1998. Uh, I've traveled all over the world um, for conferences and exhibitions, and I've studied disciplines that I probably would have never studied otherwise. Um, I make a point of reading everything I can get my hands on, even the, uh, the skeptical side, um, and I probably have one of the five best personal English language collection of materials in the world. Um, and it's just a, it's just a fascinating subject. Mm-hmm. I think everybody kind of loves a mystery. And to me, I think the shroud is pretty much the most, um, significant mystery on the planet. And, uh, if it points to the historical Jesus, it, it has questions and ramifications for, was Jesus really the Son of God? What is the meaning of life? What's going to happen to me after I die? Um, it impacts on, on all that, and even though we're not going to get as many answers about it as we like, um, it's sort of a, like a dangling carrot in front of us, um, and I just feel uh, drawn to pursue that. On the other side of the coin, what happens if the scientific experimentations continue and the scientists prove that the Shroud of Turin is a shroud, but the image is not that of Jesus Christ because the dating is wrong? Yeah. Well, I think, like, as I said before, I think there's a theoretical possibility of that happening. Mm-hmm. But based on what I know, and, you know, I've been studying for about 41 years now, and um, I just can't see them coming up with enough evidence to override um, all the evidence that they've gathered so far. I think it's important to, to state that in terms of the amount of hours that, has, that have been put into the study of the Shroud of Turin, mm-hmm. that object is literally the most intensely studied artifact in human history. And I maintain that if that many hours have been put into it, and it was a fake, Mm -hmm. they would have proven that by now. Uh, And they haven't. But are we talking about the most studied object in history from a theological outlook or a scientific outlook? Any. Well, I I find that hard to believe that there would be more time spent by the scientific community on the Shroud of Turin than there is on any other subject. Uh, you will see that stated constantly in the literature. I, you know, I know of a friend of mine, uh, Dr. John Jackson, mm-hmm. who was the co-founder of the SERP team that studied it in 1978. He personally has spent uh, over 40,000 hours in his life studying the shroud. The SERP team back in probably the early 80s had already spent about 250,000 man hours. Um, it's it's huge. It's just uh, people have spent 40, 50 years studying these things, and it, and it gets into your bones, and you you just spend all sorts of time and money, and you you know build shroud centers, and it, it's a it's just an attraction that some people um, end up spending you know most of their lives doing. Um, why would you call it an why why would why would you call a religious artifact an attraction? 
Um, when people talk about attractions, they talk about Disneyland. They talk about Marineland. Well, I've, I've never heard a religious location or artifact called an attraction before. Well, and it's, a, it's an attraction insofar as, you you know, you're drawn to it. Um, maybe that was a poor, poor choice of words on my part. Um, but I, I think it goes more to what I was saying before about I think it impacts on the most important questions in life, mm -hmm. which is kind of like, you know, maybe the top question is, you know, what's the meaning of life? What are we doing here? Why am I on this planet? Where am I going to go after I die? Do I even continue to exist? And since it impacts on Christianity and the question of eternal life and uh, the validity of God having a son and all that, um, it's just, it's just, you know, it's something that people feel drawn to, to try to find out as much as they can. Would it be safe to say that this is also a total object of faith and one's belief in that part of religious philosophy? Um. Can you, you know, say that another way? I'm not sure I'm... Well, certainly, it's very simple. Here. You believe it because it's part of your religious tenet, right? Well, I mean, when I came across the Shroud in the late 70s... All right, hold on. We're going to have to take another break. This is our final break, Exxon Nation. Our guest this hour is Joseph Marino. We're talking about the Shroud of Turin, and his website is homestead.com forward slash new vistas. I'm Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon. Don't forget, the X Chronicles newspaper is now available at www.xchroniclesnewspaper.com. We'll be back wrapping up this hour after these short breaks. Named one of the world's greatest psychics, Elizabeth Joyce is now giving readings worldwide via Skype. Elizabeth Joyce is recognized for her clairvoyant ability to help find missing persons, her analysis of dreams, past life regression work, mediumship, and her accurate predictions. Elizabeth has been a frequent guest on the Exxon Radio Show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, now for several years. For an appointment with Elizabeth Joyce, call 201-934-8986 or Skype at elizabeth.joyce. And for more information, you can always visit Elizabeth Joyce online at www.new-visions.com. The new nonfiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought-provoking tell-all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are in fact destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Expose Novel details this epidemic through an in-depth professional and personal investigation. For decades, there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. I'm William S. Peckham. If you enjoy a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love my novel, From Out of the Woodwork. It's the story of a young Toronto contractor, Sean Kennedy, who buys derelict homes, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings, slums just waiting to happen. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, the house fights back. Former owners unexpectedly come out of the woodwork as he starts the destruction. The apparitions come to him when he touches old books reads hidden letters, rummages through old boxes, finds a locket or reads a discovered manuscript of a murder mystery. From Out of the Woodwork will take you from 1899 to the horror of the World Trade Center, September 11, 2001.
2001. Check out From Out of the Woodwork on my website, www.williamspeckham.com. Joseph Marino is our guest, ExoNation. We're talking about the Shroud of Turin. And uh, Joseph, I, I, let me rephrase the question that I asked you. Maybe uh, I can uh, better better get asked the question if I was to say, you are a Catholic. Catholics have their own way of believing. Uh, well, the... I'm not officially a Catholic anymore, for, for what's that worse. All right, you were a Catholic. Correct. Okay. And there are many religious philosophies in this world today that do not believe the Bible. They do not believe the uh, creation as depicted in the book of Genesis. They do not believe the New Testament, the life of Jesus Christ. And they do not believe in the book of Revelation that was written by Paul so many years after. My question is, people who believe in the Shroud of Turin they, do they believe it because this is part of their religious beliefs and the religious doctrine of which they are part of, or is it something else? Well, I don't think there's a one answer fits all. Per- personally, um, when I first came across mm-hmm. the crowd, even though I've been raised Catholic, I was actually agnostic and, and probably fairly anti-Christian at that particular point. And... Um, I read my first book in, in one night mm-hmm. and uh, became convinced simply by the scientific evidence and historical evidence that it was probably authentic. And then I felt that that was um, confirmed after the, the STIRP testing in 1978 and all the subsequent evidence after that. So um, I, I don't think you'll find any um, Catholic or you know Christian that would say um, – that if the shroud was proven fake, I, I, I wouldn't become a Christian. I wouldn't be a Christian anymore. Um, but on the other hand, I think it can strengthen the faith, your faith, to the point where you go in the right direction, and then and you become convinced, and then you go back to Scripture, and then you your faith becomes stronger that way. It, it's kind of a, a the shroud is almost a, a paradox of some kind, where you know it shouldn't have that much of a fact one way or the other, but it seems to. When did the Shroud first come to light? Well, historically, we know exactly where it's been since uh, around 1355. And before that, um, the history is, um, you can make a plausible case for its existence based on history and art and and um, the fact that there were two claws known, one early on called the image of Edessa, and then um, a second one called the Mandilion. And many historians uh, believe that all three of those are, the, are in fact, the same cloth. Um, but historically, we only know for sure where it's been since 1357. But when people say, oh, you know, the history is, is weak, I, mm-hmm. I would say that any museum piece you see, nobody knows where those objects have been every single second uh, for hundreds of uh, of years and centuries. So, um, you know, it comes down to really a matter of faith, if you want to believe it or not. That's exactly it. It's, it's like I was saying, it's a matter of faith. If you want to believe it, great. If not, you know, it's it's a matter of faith. I don't, you know, like a, a true Christian or a true follower of, of, of Jesus will not, the cloth won't make a difference because they already believe. But on the other hand, I look at the entire scenario and I'm saying, well, geez, if it is proven that all these people are believing that there is a cloth, that it is associated with Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is supposed to be the Son of God, and this proves to be wrong, what else are we being told that mm-hmm. is true, that is nothing else but false? Like we, you know, like when you look at the Bible, there are many stories in there that you say, "Oh, come on, give me a break." Like we know, for example, yeah. a, a, with the with the with Noah's Ark, there's no way in heaven that he could have put every animal, every insect, every bird 
two by two. It's impossible. Sure. So where do we draw the line between a good story with a lot of good uh, good lessons in it and the fact? Where, did, where do we draw that line as a society in the year 2018? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think, you know, the further you go back, mm -hmm. um, the harder it is to, to prove that something actually happened. But it, right. on the other hand, you could, you could think, um, you know, I'm amazed that, you know, like if you look at uh, the death of Elvis or the death, death of GFK, mm -hmm. you have people that, that were around and witnessed those things. And, and nobody can agree on actually what happened in those cases. So, um, even in modern times, uh, we have trouble coming to a conclusion, even when multiple people witness the same thing and, and, and they can't come to uh, uh, an agreed-on conclusion. Yes, but we're not talking about billions of people around the world who believe in the same thing. We're talking about apples and acorns, and uh, you know, comparing the the life and times of Jesus Christ compared to that of Elvis Presley and John F. Kennedy. You know, yeah. I, well, it's not an exact analogy, but my point is, um, you know, certainty in in mm -hmm. modern times is is can be as difficult as certainty in you know the you know, the old testament times okay people disagree about everything basically it's the kind of human nature the way it is tell me about your book uh my book is called wrapped up in the shroud chronicle of a passion mm -hmm. and that title is a pun i, I happen to be a, a lover of puns and that is a play on words because it refers to um, Jesus um, literally, and it refers to me metaphorically. Uh, came out in uh, December 2011, and um, I'm going to be retiring from work uh, in October. And I think my first big project is to um, revise and update that book because I've got about six more years of material since I think I finished writing in like in September 2011. So a lot of things have happened since then that I yeah. want to add, uh, add to it. Well, good for you. Good for you. What is the message that you want the readers of your book to, to come away with? Well, um, my publisher kind of convinced me to um, write the book because mm -hmm. uh, she said it's a great love story. And the story of the research that you and your wife uh, did is, is pretty fascinating. Um, it's a it's a neat human interest story. It's a neat story uh, about uh, an object that's, that continues to fascinate people. You know, even after um, the carbon dating tests were, res uh, were were announced in 1988, people still flock to the cathedral to see the shroud. Mm -hmm. And that may be, you know, you could. You know, some that are put that on to people wanting to believe despite the, the scientific evidence. But um, it's a neat story. Uh, of course, I'm biased. I lived it. Sure. Uh, a lot of strange things happened that, that I would put in the um, category of mystical. And that's part of the reason why I think it's authentic, because um, a lot of the things that have happened to me related to the Shroud really can't be explained rationally. Can you give us an I example? That... Sure, I can give you a good one. Okay. Um, I actually had uh, a relic. It was actually, uh, I was told originally it was a piece of the real shroud, and I let two scientists look at it, and it was a, actually just the piece of the, um, the backing of the shroud. And at the time, um, I was in the monastery. Um, it was in a little reliquary. And um, a nephew of mine uh, had a brain tumor. So um, I was going to bring the relic to the hospital and touch it to him. Mm -hmm. And um, it was about that time um, I had a small booklet uh, on uh, about the shroud and, and visions that four nuns had had about the shroud. And I, I had recently lost the booklet, uh, but I had found the full version that that booklet was made from, and I ordered it, and it was on its way. So 
So the day I was getting ready to go to the hospital, I got the relic out and I was in my little room, my little cell in the monastery. And um, I just started thinking about the whole theology of uh, affecting cures with relics. Right. And uh, that, that falls into the category of mystical theology. And that some, it kind of made me think of that um, booklet that I lost, because that was also about mystical theology. And at the precise second that I thought of that booklet being lost, I heard a noise behind me, and I turned around, and the booklet had hit on the floor behind my back. I didn't see where it came from. I heard it hit. The booklet had been lost. I had no idea where it was. It wasn't stuck to the ceiling, I can tell you that. Right. But it happened at the precise second that I recalled that that booklet uh, was missing. And it was almost as if God was saying, yeah, mystical theology is valid. So it's that sort of, um, those sorts of experiences that, you know, I, I don't have a rational explanation for that. Bruno, I want to th- uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Joseph, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight here on the X-Zone. We have to say so long for now. And X-Zone Nation, if you'd like to get more information about our guest this hour, Bruno Marino, his website is www.homestead.com, a new vistas. This is the X-Zone. I am Rob McConnell, and I'll be back on the other side of the news at six and a half minutes past the top of the hour as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't forget, the X-Chronicles newspaper is now available at www.xchroniclesnewspaper.com. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Are you, or is someone you know, struggling with addictions, depression, anxiety, relationships, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, grief, success, and prosperity? Do you know that your subconscious belief plays a big role in the outcome of your hard work? We can help you permanently change the beliefs that may be the reason for your struggles and failures. We care about getting you the return on your investment and the results you are looking for. We can help you be free of the limitations of your past and in realizing your highest potential. We work with people by phone and Skype. For more information, visit us at www.ritasoman.com. That's www.ritasoman.com. Do you think you have energy problems in your home? Do you feel better when you're away than when you're home? Joey Korn is a global leader in the world of dowsing who specializes in personal energy clearing and space clearing. He can help you create an ideal energy environment in your home no matter where you live in the world. Learn about his remote spiritual house cleaning services and much more at www.dowsers.com. You can get Joey's book, Dowsing, A Path to Enlightenment, as well as other dowsing books and tools, Kabbalah books, and Walter Russell books. Joey's work is really amazing. 
Go to dowsers.com right now. That's D O W S E R S dot com or call 1 877 Dowsing. That's 1 877 369 7464.